Hello and welcome to today's lesson on levers and gears. Now today's lesson is for GCSE separate science physics in the forces module. So we're going to be looking at how to see le how levers and gears transmit moments in systems. So in today's lesson what we're going to be looking at is we're going to try and define what a moment is and link this to levers and gears, understand how a simple lever and gear system can be used to transmit the rotational effect of forces and then finally explain how levers and gears transmit the rotational effects of forces which links into the following part of the GCSE separate science course for physics. Now this is separate science only content so if you do GCSE combined science this is not on your examination it's only on separate science. So to look at, at this particular example let's look at four different examples that of a seesaw, that of someone opening a door, of a wheelbarrow and of someone actually screwing in a nut with their spanner which one is the odd one out? Well the odd one out is the idea of the um, the wheelbarrow because this one shows simple moments with no mechanical advantages okay uh, the other three sorry whilst this picture shows a lever transmitting the moment in the object so we're going to consider the effects of levers and gears in the real world now a spanner is an example of an object having a moment exerted on it now the moment is caused by a force being applied from a distance from the pivot like we mentioned previously now this is a very very simple mechanical system it's literally one person exerting a force a particular distance away from a pivot which is causing a rotational effect now this system will require a lot of force or as we say in mechanics effort to make it work now that can be shown because in the real world it can be actually very very difficult for you to tighten or loosen a screw on certain different um, objects and devices now humans soon devise ways to make this task a lot easier to carry out now an example of a more complex mechanical system is a lever now a lever is a device which is used to transmit a moment in the system and alter the forces at different parts of the system so here the effort force the force that you are putting into the system produces a moment this is then transmitted throughout the system by the lever which produces a much larger force at the tip of the crowbar which lifts the load so in a lever what happens is the forces can change size but the moment across the system the force times by perpendicular distance must be the same so levers work by the following principle that the moment at each part of a system is the same but the force can change at different parts of the system so a force is a quantity which doesn't have to be conserved in a system there are many different examples in physics where forces do not get conserved. So don't um, confuse forces with energy. Energy always has to be conserved in a closed system. However, however, forces do not. So this means it's possible to change the output force to make it easier for a human to carry out a task. So what happens here is the effort is the force that the person applies to the mechanical system. The load is the force needed to be moved. So the lever increases the output force compared to the effort force placed into the system so tasks can be carried out. So here we can make the output force much higher than the effort force placed in because the moment is the same so it makes it easier to do the work. So it's what we call an example of a force multiplier. So what happens is we can change or multiply the size of the force to make it appropriate for the task being carried out. Now this happens as in this particular system the lever um, is much closer to the pivot than the hand is. So what that means is to produce the same moment throughout the system and moment is force times by distance if the distance from the pivot to where the, le the lever is lifting the safe is much smaller therefore the force must be much larger because force times by distance must be the same on either side of the pivot so it naturally increases the force so we've gained what we said and it will call in physics a mechanical advantage we've increased our force to carry out a task that we want because there's no law in physics which states that forces have to be conserved Okay, so in a lever system, we've increased the force applied to the object. 
Now, any system which is made up of a number of parts which make up a force multiplier is called a machine. So that's an example of a machine. So we can show this in the example of a bottle opener. So here we've got a lever acting as a bottle opener. Now we know that in this lever system, the moment must be conserved. Now the human exerts a small force at the end of the lever, and since moment is the force multiplied by the distance, it's a large moment, because even though the force the human has applied is small, the distance from the pivot is large, so moment is force times by distance, so you've got a large moment. Now if we look onto the other side of the pivot, the point at which the air bottle top is there, because the distance between the pivot and the bottle top is a lot smaller than the distance between the human and the pivot, so to create the same moment, as the distance has gone down, the force has gone up, so the output force is larger than the effort force placed in by the human, this allows the bottle top to be released. So that's we've gained a mechanical advantage. This system has acted as a force multiplier. It's turned a small effect of a force the human has placed into the system into a large force on the object. We have gained a mechanical advantage. Another example will be scissors. So you'll notice that the human applies the force at the, ho at the hoops that you put your fingers in at the end of the scissors. There's a large distance between where the force is applied by the human and the pivot of the scissors. But where you cut your object, and the distance between the pivot and where it cuts the object is small. So to produce a constant moment throughout the system, because the distance between the object and the pivot is smaller, the force must be larger, so it allows you to cut through the object. Now that's why if you place objects far away from the pivot at the tips of the blades of the scissors, it doesn't work as effectively because now the distance is a lot larger, so the force exerted by those blades will be smaller, so it wouldn't cut as easily. So it all works on this principle of levers, and in the lever system, the moment must be conserved. So if you wanted to act as a force multiplier, you've got to get the object close to the pivot so that the distance is small, so that the force is large, so you've gained mechanical advantage and you've kept your moment constant. Now that's so like I said before, that's why it's difficult to cut an object at the tips of the scissors as the, the force produced is not as big as the distance from the pivot is larger. So again, it's this example that will conserve the moment and will gain the mechanical advantage. So a lever is a mechanical system which transmits the rotational effects of a force, a moment. So it means that the moment throughout a lever is constant in the system. So we can change the force acting on different parts of the lever. The closer the lever is to the pivot, the larger the force exerted by the, the lever, which is a mechanical advantage, to keep the moment produced the same. So a lever is a system which alters the force to keep the moment constant. It acts as a force multiplier to make it easier to do work on objects. Now, gears, like levers, also act as force multipliers, but they transmit the power by changing the moment of a force. Now, gears are simply wheels with teeth around their rims. When two gears are arranged so that their teeth interlock, an effort force is applied to one, the driving or drive gear, and is passed on to the other gear, the driven gear. Now, gears can actually change a lot more than the moment. They can change the moment, they can change the speed, they can change the direction of the force, they can change quite a bit regarding your system. So what happens is, like I mentioned before, gears are simply wheels with teeth uh, located around their rims. Now, in all gear systems, the wheels rotate in opposite directions because the teeth of one gear fits into the teeth of another gear. This lets one gear turn the other, meaning the axle or shaft can be used to turn another shaft. Now, as one gear turns, the other gear must also turn, and so where the gears must meet, the teeth must move in the same direction. Now, with the diagram, the teeth of both gears are moving um, downwards, so this means that the gears are both rotating in opposite directions. Now, in all gear systems, the rotational effect and the power are transmitted in the system, so they've got to remain constant. This means that we can change our moment to change the power, so make sure the power is conserved in the system. Now, different size gears can be used to change the moment of the force. So a force is transmitted 
to a large to a force transfer to a larger gear will cause a larger moment as the distance from the interlocking teeth, which is where the force is exerted, to the pivot will be greater. Now we know that in this example that there's a larger distance between where they interlock to where the pivot is, which is always the centre of a wheel, will get a larger moment. So a large distance gives a large moment, a small distance gives a small moment. Now how do we know this? It's because we know that both air wheels must have the same force exerted upon it because this is Newton's third law in action. They're exerting an equal but opposite force of each other on each other, so it's the force of the same size but in opposite direction, which is causing the opposite rotation. Now, gears are used in many machines, like bikes and cars, to change the power output of the machine, even if the input's kept the same. Now, with a low gear, so for example, in a low gear of a car or a bike, a small gear wheel is driven by the engine to turn a large wheel on the output. This makes the output turn uh, smaller than the engine. This makes the moment greater because the wheel is now larger. So therefore, this allows a larger moment and allows your object to overcome inertia. So we've altered our frozen system to suit our needs. We've gained a mechanical advantage, but we're more likely to accelerate off. And that's what we use lower gears for, to start the acceleration process of motion. Now in high gears, a large gear wheel is driven by the engine to turn a small wheel on the output. This makes the output turn faster than the engine, which makes the moment of the output lower because we've got a smaller wheel now. So therefore, it's going to be we're going to alter our properties of the system to suit our needs. We've gained a mechanical advantage because it allows a faster speed on the output but a smaller moment. Now this is useful because it makes the object maintain a steady a steady high speed which is what you want for a high gear so let's just clarify this a gear is a mechanical system where at least two wheels interlock now these interlocking allows for power to be transmitted between the two wheels so in the gear system the power remains constant which indicates that the energy in the system remains constant throughout and the force acting on both wheels is the same due to newton's third law now if we have wheels where they have the same number of teeth and they are the same size, the moment and the speed on each wheel would be the same. However, just remember that the wheels would rotate in opposite directions. In all gear systems, the wheels rotate in opposite directions. Now let's consider an, a system where the input wheel has more teeth than the output wheel. This is a high gear. Now again, remember, both of our wheels are rotating in opposite directions, and power and energy is being transmitted between the two. Now a higher gear will have a higher moment than the smaller wheel, so what this means is, this means that the output wheel, because it is smaller, will be rotating faster, even though it has a smaller moment, because more power is going to the speed of the output wheel, this makes the object maintain a steady speed easily, which is what you want in a high gear. So if a smaller gear is driven by a larger gear, the larger gear will rotate quickly by a smaller moment. So the smaller gear will rotate quickly by a smaller moment. So that's what we use them for. Now in a low gear, the low basically what a low gear is is where your input wheel has less teeth than the output wheel. So the low gear will what will cause the following? It will cause the power to be constant. So more power goes to the force. This gives the object a resultant force to overcome inertia. So the output wheel will have a lower speed, yet a higher moment, because it's larger. So the distance from the interlocking to the center will be greater. So there's a greater distance, there's a greater moment. So if a larger gear is driven by a smaller gear, the large gear will rotate slowly, but will have a greater moment, so it's more likely to accelerate, which is what you want from your lower gears. So here's an example question they could ask you in an exam. So a gear with a radius of 0.1 meters is turned by a gear with a radius of 0.05 meters. The moment of the smaller gear is 20 newtons. Calculate the moment of the larger gear. Well, you do step one, and that's calculating the force on the teeth of the smaller gear. Well, you know that moment equals force times by distance. So force equals moment over distance. You pop your values in, and you know that the force on the, the first gear, the smaller gear, the input gear, is 400 newtons. Now, we know that because it's interlocking, so there's only two objects, and they exert the force on each other, that these forces must be equal yet opposite. 
So we now know that if the force on the first gear is 400 newtons, well then the force on the second gear must be 400 newtons. So now we can calculate the moment of the larger gear. So the moment is force times by distance, and we know now the force is 400. We know our distance is 0.1, because that's the distance from where the force is exerted to the pivot, the centre of the gear. The center of the wheel, sorry. So you do 400 times by 0.1, which is 40 newton meters, which works, okay? Because if you think about it, this means that the turning of a gear has doubled the radius because now we're going from 0.05 meters to 0.1 meters, so we've doubled the moment, we've doubled the rotational effect, which makes sense because the, the distance is larger. So as a result, it's a two times force multiplier. So a gear is a mechanical system which acts as a force and speed multiplier, and the gears do this by changing the moment of a force. Low gears give a low speed and a high moment to conserve the power, force and energy of the system, whilst high gears give an output with a high speed and a low moment, which conserves the power, the force and the energy of the system. So let's just clarify what we've learned. Levers give a mechanical advantage. They act as a force multiplier because they transmit moments. They keep moments constant. Whilst gears give a mechanical advantage, act as a rotational force multiplier, act as a speed multiplier, but they transmit, so keep power and the force constant in the system. But just remember that these systems will only act as force multipliers when the rotational effects of forces are being used, the moments. So if they're not being driven by a force given a, given a rotational effect, they will not act as force multipliers. The most common example of this is a bike going downhill. Now if a bike was going along okay, in a, on a flat plane, the gears will be working, they'll be acting as force multipliers, they'll be producing that output that you want. But when you go downhill, you don't tend to pedal because the force um, will, that's causing the acceleration is gravity because you're going downhill. So in that particular example, the gears of the, um, of the bike are not acting as force multipliers because they're not being rotated by you pedaling. So in that instance, the bike is not acting as a force multiplier. So let's just summarize what we've learned today. That the turning effect of a force is called the moment, and the force or a system of forces can cause an object to rotate. That the size of a moment is moment equals force times by distance, and a simple lever and a simple gear system can be used to transmit the effect of forces, the rotational effect of the forces. And you should be able to explain how levers and gears transmit these rotational effects. So if you've been successful and learned in today's lesson, you can define what a moment is and link it to levers and gears, understand how a simple lever and gear system can be used to transmit the rotational effect of forces and it explain how levers and gears transmit the rotational effects of forces. So thank you for listening to today's lesson on levers and gears. In the next lesson in this particular series we'll move on to another concept which is linking into pressure and gas pressure of systems. Thank you very very much and have a lovely day.